Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got into this situation. Well, let me explain. It all started with this. E3D's Hermes, or now Himera, introduced a new compact heat break mount. A couple of years later, the reason for that became clear. There's a whole new ecosystem of hot ends, extruders, and integrated nozzle brakes that all revolve around this new form factor that makes nozzle swaps faster and printing more reliable. E3D was calling it Revo. But there was a small problem. Only E3D are allowed to make nozzles for it, and the only nozzles they were making were plain brass. Which meant you could only print with filaments that were non-abrasive. But E3D knew about this, and they promised it would make a nozzle to end all nozzles. They called it the Obexidian. It's just that that was really it. There were promises of it being available soon for almost a year, then when it was finally scheduled to be unveiled, that release got cancelled on short notice, which was frustrating for me. I had an Obixidian, I had two. I wanted to have a video on it available at launch and had spent a bunch of time on it, but when the launch got cancelled, I had to shuffle and find a different topic I could produce a video on in just a couple of days to stick with my two-week release schedule. And when the Obixidian was then finally actually released, E3D gave a generous three business day notice to please have your content ready on launch. Well, I don't typically keep videos around just waiting to be released. So what you're watching now obviously isn't the launch video I was hoping to make. And since I assume just how well the Obixidian prints is now well covered by everyone else, I'm going to do something that nobody else is doing. I'm going to attempt to destroy it for science. And hopefully it will put up a bit more of a fight than this powderized brass nozzle. All that right after a message from today's sponsor, Onshape. Onshape is a fully featured CAD and PDM platform designed for business but free for makers. Onshape is entirely cloud-based so there's nothing to install and it has real-time sharing and collaboration built right in. Of course, you get a fully featured CAD workspace and the new FEA features, but you can also extend them with your own tools in their feature script programming language or add extra functionality with one of the many. Start exploring Onshape for your personal or professional projects at onshape.pro slash Thomas Sanagra. So, the Obexidian. First of all, this thing has nothing to do with actual Obsidian. Other than it's black, it's shimmery, it looks cool. There are nozzles out there like the Ruby nozzle that actually use an inserted gemstone. The Obexidian also has a hard insert. But real Obsidian would be a pretty poor choice for that. It would be a cool novelty, but Obsidian, being a volcanic glass, is rather soft, brittle, and not very wear resistant. Uh, instead, the Obsidian uses a hardened tool steel insert pressed into a copper body, and then all of that is coated with what they call E3 DLC. Their materials seem to be a bit reluctant in actually explicitly saying that you know the E3 DLC is an actual diamond-like carbon coating, as the name would imply. So I asked them, and they confirmed that it's mostly a diamond-like carbon coating, but their design goals for their version of the DLC seem to be a bit different from what it would typically tune that coating process for. Usually, you'd want a very thin and hard layer. Instead, one of the main things that E3D tuned for was keeping plastic from sticking to it. You know, those, those black boogers that you sometimes find in your parts? those should be mostly eliminated. And also, I guess the nozzle would not drag on freshly extruded material as much, which might slightly improve things like overhang printing performance. I have not printed with this, and like I said, I think that's already well covered. I've tested the Revo hotend when it first came out using the original uh, brass nozzles, and that's a good hotend. It prints well, it has better throughput than V6, of course it's all proprietary, but honestly, when E3D make a new product, I kind of trust that it's not going to be a total dud. Sure, there might sometimes be some issues that only pop up at volume and that really only are relevant when you have a high expectation of quality to start with. And those are things like the bearings and some of the Titan extruders failing too quickly or the gears and some of the Himera extruders cracking. Those cases are rare and I think they've been handled well by E3D in the past. 
What I'm saying is that E3D will have tested the performance of their products, especially Arctic City and the flagship product, to their best ability before they put them onto the market. And I would rather have a product that is late but well executed instead of one that was rushed and is on time but just ends up being frustrating overall. So what I can do is, you know, go past what E3D could have tested and see just where the limits are. And in this case, that means testing where until something gives. Stefan on CNC Kitchen has concluded in the past that the majority of a nozzle's wear when printing abrasive filaments like, you know, glow in the dark or carbon composites, that wear is happening on the very tip of the nozzle and not that much in the bore itself. So that's what I'm going to try and replicate. Time to build a nozzle destroyer. So this is it, obviously using my test platform printer as a basis here. Um, we've got the nozzle in a little slide right here, free to move up and down. We've got our test medium on the bottom here and gravity is pushing the nozzle into our medium. In this case, you know, I'm starting with a sheet of carbon fiber. As the nozzle rubs across that, that should somewhat simulate it rubbing across a carbon filled print. Now the kicker is this guy over here. This is a webcam. Full 1080p, though the image doesn't quite look like 1080p, but I've tweaked the focus so that we can get a nice close-up macro shot of the nozzle. Now, originally I wanted to use Octolapse to create a time-lapse for me, but since my torture G-code doesn't really have any layers and I couldn't get the manual G-code trigger to work in Octolapse, I ended up just writing a quick Python script that remote controls Octoprint and then grabs images off of the webcam feed remotely through OpenCV, because why not? Octoprint has a fantastic API and that just made this super easy. So the way I've set up the nozzle destroyer is that it will start over the camera, that's the home position, then it moves over to the starting point, drops the z-axis, which gets the nozzle riding on our grind medium, and then moves back and forth 20 times, picks the nozzle back up, or at least what's left of it, moves it over the camera, takes a snap, and over the next eight hours, it repeats all that 1,000 times for a total of 4,000 meters of dragging the nozzle across our abrasive material. That's a pretty brutal test. So in the end, each frame in the nozzle cam's time-lapse is four meters of grinding apart. And what you're seeing now is the very first one I did. It's a cheap brass nozzle getting dragged over this plain carbon fiber sheet. Now an E3D hardened steel one. Okay, there's something happening. Finally, the obsidian, not that much different. Most of all, none of the nozzles were affected by this noticeably at all. Couple of notes here. First of all, these are all different nozzles. The brass one has a super pointy geometry, at least it used to. Uh, so the approximately 40 grams of force from gravity create a bit more pressure than on the less pointy hardened steel one, and on the obsidian, that same force gets distributed to an even larger area because E3D only sent me 0.6 millimeter ones. The box said 0.4, so I thought I had comparable nozzle sizes, but I don't. So I'm trying to make up for the roughly doubled area of the 0.6 millimeter tip by roughly doubling the force pressing down on it. That turned out to be only a mildly smart idea, but we'll get to that later. For now, it does not look like, you know, this carbon fiber sheet made any sort of an impact to the brass, hardened, or obsidian nozzles, even though carbon fiber is supposed to be one of the more abrasive materials these nozzles typically touch. And I think that's because the nozzles aren't actually making contact with the fibers themselves. Uh, they're just making contact with the resin impregnation in the carbon fiber composite sheet. You can see the shavings and the flakes are white or clear and not black like the carbon fibers themselves. I could let these tests run until one of the nozzles finally breaks through the resin layer, or I could slightly help it along. Of course, that's what I did. Side note, carbon fiber dust is extremely nasty, 
always wear a mask when cutting or grinding it and have some good dust extraction. But this is now properly roughed up and we definitely have the bare fibers exposed. Let's go again. The obsidian and the hardened nozzle again don't seem to be affected by the grinding much. If anything, they look like they actually just got polished uh, or wiped clean by the fibers. I was able to measure a marginal reduction in length on the hard nozzle. It went down five thousandths of a millimeter, but that could easily be, I don't know, thermal expansion or something. I did measure something, but I'm not sure that it's actually wear. The brass nozzle, however, did definitely see some wear this time. You can see it getting polished away essentially and ended up losing almost one tenth of a millimeter in length. Now, this is significant. It would definitely mess up your nozzle height offset, but assuming that actually printing carbon fiber would wear away the nozzle in a way that also smooths over the edges, this nozzle would be way past usable at this point. Honestly, I didn't think carbon fiber would eat into brass this quickly. But here I was struggling. We saw that brass wears more easily, but we already knew this. So how do I figure out if the E3 DLC coating on the Obexidian improves wear over a plain hardened nozzle? I really couldn't think of a surface that was just a little more abrasive than the carbon fiber and would last through an eight hour test. That kicked out stuff like polishing compounds, those would need to be reapplied constantly. And everything else, like sandpapers, just seemed way too aggressive to actually test with. But I needed something that would at least eat into the hardened steel. And the only things that do that are grinding materials. So I went straight to the sharpening stone. Obviously, you've already seen it on the machine. That was the plan, or at least the backup plan all along. You've seen the thumbnail, so here we are. This is a cheap aluminum oxide stone. I had more of these at some point, but they disappeared during the studio move. It doesn't say which grit it is. I would guess somewhere around 800 or so uh, on the fine side. So it is pretty coarse and pretty aggressive, just as a disclaimer to start with. And when it comes to just how aggressive this is, here's what it did to the brass nozzle. It's gone. I even had to stop the test halfway through and readjust the zero position because the nozzle was now so much shorter that it was completely out of the camera's focus plane. I mean, I could measure how much length we lost exactly, but honestly, I don't quite see the point in that. Uh, there's just not much left, you know? The hardened steel nozzle fared much better, but it still lost quite a bit of material. I don't think I'd still want to print with this one either. Now, something interesting is happening with this one, and it's that the grinding progress seems to slow down the more the nozzle is already ground away. And this could be either the grindstone having worn away and now being dull essentially, or what I think is also very plausible is because the contact area of the nozzle gets larger as it wears away, but the downforce stays the same, the pressure pushing the steel into the grind medium reduces to a point where the grit just isn't digging into the steel anymore, but rather you get sort of a skating action uh, where the nozzle mostly skips over the grit. So the obsidian. Well, this one got obliterated too much more so than the hardened one actually. I spent a couple days thinking about how that happened. In theory, it all worked out. I had twice the surface area at the tip because this is a 0.6 and the others were a 0.4, so with double the force on it, it should be comparable. But as always, things aren't quite as perfect in practice because what you can clearly see is that we didn't actually get the entire tip to make contact, it was just one corner at the start taking the entire force where we immediately ate through the coating and only then slowly started gaining contact area but at that point we're mostly grinding at the hardened steel core and not at the coating anymore and that's making the obsidian look worse than it is in practice the coating is all that's going to matter for longevity if you ever make it through that that nozzle is past its useful life now looking at the first couple grinding cycles those tell us a lot about what's actually going on. Look at the hardened steel again. Within a single cycle, we've ground it down enough to make full contact, and every subsequent cycle then evenly eats into the material more and more. But with obsidian, it takes a good 10 cycles to even grind it to the same size contact patch that the hardened steel one was after its very first one. And that is with twice the amount of force on the obsidian driving it into the stone. But this didn't satisfy me yet. Having tested the obsidian with essentially, come on, <laughs> having tested the obsidian with essentially too much weight, 
meant that the results wouldn't be representative, even though there is a clear difference visible. So I did what had to be done, and I sacrificed the second Obix that an E3D had sent me. This time, with the same amount of weight on it as the hardened one. Well, maybe in total a couple grams more, uh, because the Revo nozzles themselves are a little heavier than standard V6 types. And this time, wow, did the obsidian last long. It still wasn't chucked up perfectly perpendicular, but it took basically the entirety of the 1000 grind cycles to get to the same size of contact patch as the hardened nozzle reaches in just a single cycle. There is barely any grind dust visible on the grindstone, and the dust we can see on the nozzle cam is white, which has me thinking that we actually ground away more of the stone itself than of the nozzle. That is really impressive. So with these results, what I would conclude is that the obixidin is at least a thousand times more abrasion resistant than a hardened nozzle, at least in this setup. E3D feel free to use that as a testimonial. There is a whole lot more to this though. E3D only rate the obix in to 300 degrees Celsius. Is that because the hardened steel core slowly loses its hardness at those temperatures? Or is it because the carbon coating uh, will diffuse into the steel at those temperatures? Does the coating itself change properties as it gets hot? I would assume that the coating would perform just as well at high temperatures, while a bare hardened steel one would abrade even faster. And lastly, the most important question I guess for you as well is, should you use an obsidian? Well, from what I see, yes, they're about twice as much as a regular Revo nozzle. So if you wear through just a single brass one, an obsidian will already have paid for itself. Unless you abuse them like I did, or you bent the heat break, then the obsidian should be the last nozzle you'll ever need to buy, which honestly is bad business for E3D, but it's good for you if you have one. Affiliate links in the description below. Anyway, I hope this wasn't too long to watch. This was a lot of work and a lot of trying to make sense of the results. I hope you found it just as interesting as I did. You can support further experiments through Patreon, here I think, or YouTube memberships, or just by sharing this video with your friends. Thank you for watching, keep on making, and I will see you in the next one.